Thank you to everyone who's joining us today. I'm Shelby Kearns, Executive Director of the National Association of State Budget Officers, or NASBO. And I'm excited to welcome you to NASBO's first Let's Talk State Budgets, a conversation with NASBO leadership webinar. For more than 75 years, NASBO has been the professional membership organization for governors, budget, and finance officers. As the chief financial advisors to our nation's governors, NASBO members are influential decision makers in state government. They guide their states in analysis of budget options and in the formation of sound public policy. Budget officers are on the front lines managing issues facing states and their role has been paramount during the COVID-19 pandemic as governors reacted to uncertain and quickly changing economic conditions, the unprecedented needs of citizens and high levels of new federal funding to address those needs. Today, I will be joined by NASBO leadership to provide an on the ground perspective of state fiscal conditions and insight into the challenges and priorities of their states. But before turning to our panel, we're fortunate to have Emily Mandel from Moody's Analytics to set the stage with the National Economic Overview. Emily is Assistant Director and works on state and local government fiscal issues. She received her master's degree in international and development economics from Yale University and her bachelor's degree in economics and international studies from Dickinson College. Emily, on behalf of NASBO and all our webinar participants, thank you for being with us and providing this timely insight into the national economic picture. Hi, thank you, Shelby, for that introduction. I'm really happy to be here, you know, virtually with you today. I think it's, you know, a really interesting time to be talking about the economy. So um, I know that we're getting a bit of, you know, recession fatigue potentially at this point. Like we've been talking about any potential recession for so long and things kind of keep kind of going okay. But something that I can, you know, tell you with 100% certainty today is that at some point there will be another recession. The question there is, when is it going to be? Is that going to hit us within the next year? Are we in a recession now, as some people have said? Um, or is it something that we're going to be able to weather through these next couple of years, kind of, you know, follow that pretty narrow path, thread that needle, and be able to avoid it um, in the near term, at least. So I'm going to be talking today about a few of the tailwinds in the economy, things that can keep us moving, as well as some of the challenges we're facing and some of the pretty significant risks that are out there. Um, so let me share here. Okay. So as far as are we in a recession at this moment, at this particular point in time, I think pretty clearly the answer is no. Um, yes, we've got some slower GDP growth. Um, we have inflation, which I'm going to talk about quite a bit in a second here. But just looking at the um, labor market, um, it's telling a pretty clear sign that things are all right in that regard right now. One of the clearest signs, the best indicators we have of when a recession has started is an increase in the unemployment rate, particularly a half point over the course of a year. But right now, unemployment is low. We're at three and a half percent, and we've been there pretty stably for the past year. And so that is a pretty strong sign that recession not at this point. Um, you know, granted, the Federal Reserve is trying really hard right now to cool down the economy. That's part of the reason that the unemployment rate hasn't kept going lower. Um, and that's that's what we want right now. We want not we don't want any additional tightness um, because of these inflationary pressures. But we also don't want this unemployment rate, this difference in the unemployment rate rising above that red line there. We don't want it increasing quickly or you end up with these um, kind of compounding effects. You end up with this pretty significant decline in confidence, people pull back on spending, and you get this kind of um, snowball effect leading to recession. But we're not there right now. Um, and we haven't been even moving in that direction recently. So that's a pretty significant positive, but there's still some negatives out there. Um, consumers are nervous, right? Like I talked about one of the impacts of rising unemployment is this nervousness, but we're getting some of that just from um, inflation that we're seeing now. That's been a pretty significant concern for people and with good reason. That said though, um, uh, the conference board and the University of Michigan are both measures of consumer confidence here. And you can see that those have deteriorated over the past year. 
But at the same time, we have real consumption on here. So that's consumption, you know, taking account of the impact of inflation. That's actual real spending that people are increasing outside of prices. Um, and you can see that that is still climbing. People are still spending a good amount of money in the economy. So that stress is out there but it hasn't really manifested in a pullback in consumption. And that's really key in this economy. Our economy currently is powered really significantly by consumers, by spending on goods, by spending on services to keep those jobs afloat in the economy. And so a pullback in consumer spending, any kind of break in that, that firewall that we've got there is would be problematic but it's not something we're seeing right now. It's been a lot more of um, general talk about these problems versus an actual reduction in spending there. And there's some good reasons for that. The main reason there, the main thing that we're looking at is there's still a huge amount of money out there in the economy, right? a huge amount of cash. Um, consumers have built up a really significant amount of savings during the pandemic, during that, um, you know, during 2020 going into 2021. And that came from a couple of reasons. It came from um, federal stimulus, and it also came from just uh, pent up savings of people not spending the way they would normally. And so you can see that climbed over through mid 2021, and it started to kind of come down over the past year but it's still really elevated. There's still a huge amount of cash out there that we didn't have a couple of years ago. We still have a huge amount of those excess savings. And so that's a really good reason that consumers haven't pulled back is because they haven't needed to. They've had those reserves, they've had those resources in order to um, absorb those higher costs that we're seeing because of inflation. That said, this hasn't been the case for all households, um, especially among lower income households, people in that maybe bottom quarter of the income distribution. We've seen those excess savings really evaporate really quickly. Um, a lot of them are even below where they would have been um, prior to the pandemic because of these rising costs. So it's not equal across the economy. Some people are definitely feeling a really severe impact of this. But from a macroeconomic perspective, there's a lot of cash out there. Um, the households that would generally spend the most are the people that still have the resource to spend there. So there'll be impacts for this for sure, especially from maybe a government perspective in terms of some of those social safety net spending. Um, people are really going to need to take advantage of that in the lower tier of the income distribution. But from a macroeconomic perspective, there's a lot of cash, there's a lot of spending, and it's a really significant tailwind to the economy at this point. Oh, why are we not? Oh. Sorry, uh, that's lines there. So um, inflation though, like I mentioned, is a pretty significant problem here. Um, this is a survey of small businesses, I believe, and it looks at what their major concern is. What is the main thing that they think is holding back their business at this time? And you can see this blue line on the right side of the screen has really rocketed up over the past year, and that's inflation. Um, other major concern here, labor quality. That's significant, but that's mostly a reflection of how tight the labor market is right now. And we've seen that stabilize some over the past year, as you've seen um, the unemployment rate stabilize, as we've seen um, um, some reduction in those openings out there, some reduction in the, the mismatch between people available and the number of open jobs. Um, but inflation is definitely a concern on people's minds. And that is you know, the the risk of that and something that we're seeing, especially in some industries, is a pullback on investment. We're seeing some problems in some of those rate sensitive industries, especially housing um, and construction. Um, we're seeing some weakness in tech as a result of this. Um, and so it's it's a major concern here and it's something that's increased, but I think there's pretty good reason that as we see inflation start to come in, we'll see some of this concern start to abate some of this um, these impacts start to improve. So, like I said, inflation is one of the major problems in the economy right now. 
And it's also going to be the major thing that determines whether or not we enter into a recession over the coming year. So this chart here, it breaks up inflation into some of the major components that have been feeding it, things like food, energy, supply chains, all of these different areas that have kind of contributed to this really high inflation that we've had over the past year. Um, and then we also have a forecast period here. So you can see that our outlook is for inflation to continue to come in. We've already seen some of that. We see that it peaked earlier in 2022, and it's been coming down since then. And we expect that that to continue over the coming year. Some of this is already on autopilot. There's some things that have improved, and if they just stay the way they are right now, that's going to keep inflation coming in. I think commodity prices are one of the major ones here. We've seen oil prices come down already. And if they roughly just stay where they are at the current time, that's going to just give us base effects of inflation starting to come in. Similarly is housing. I talked briefly about how housing has been one of the industries that have been impacted by these higher rates. That's going to be a really positive for a lot of people because they're not going to see these massive increases in their rents. They're not going to see their massive increases in housing costs that we've had just because of some, um, some pullback in that industry. So shelter has been one of the major drivers of inflation over the past year. And that's something that is starting to come in. And that's something that's going to materialize a lot more over the next maybe six months or so in terms of these data metrics. The other major thing here that is going to be key to getting this all the way down and the thing that is um, one of the, the more difficult steps here is um, wage growth. We need wage growth to start to come in just because services are a pretty major driver of inflation, right? To the cost of services. And those are mainly driven by wages. And so that's going to be our kind of third step here. It's something that we've already started to see in the data. We've started to see some um, slowdown in wages here, but it's something that we have to see coming in. And that's something that should be um, relatively within the Federal Reserve's control. That's something that's relatively sensitive to interest rates. And so we expect that to keep coming in, kind of bringing inflation down to our target um, by late 2024, 2025 there. Um, so if this all sticks to script, um, then we should be able to kind of absorb those higher rates, bring down inflation. It'll allow the Federal Reserve to pause, which is really important. Um, currently, we have priced in one more 25 basis point hike um, and then a pause, and that should allow the economy to absorb some of these higher rates um, without, um, without too much additional pain relative to where we are now. That said, there's a huge amount that could go wrong. We're in a really um, kind of fragile place because there's a lot of these external shocks that could hit the economy. Um, we have the conflict in Russia and Ukraine. We have these rising rates. The Federal Reserve could over tighten and that could lead to some problems. Um, the pandemic, it's out there. Um, it's improved. We've seen some of the impacts kind of lessen, especially with China beginning to open up their economy. But it's another potential risk there. The main thing I'm that's on my mind right now is oil prices. I think that's something where currently they're around, what, $80, $85 per barrel. If that were to go up above 95, hitting that $100 per barrel level, I think that's definitely something that could push us into recession. So we have our glide path. We're, you know, threading that needle, but there's a lot out there that could push us off that. So what does this finally, you know, imply for the economy over the next couple of years? We're calling it a slow session. So we've defined that, you know, all using our own prerogative as a period of temporary economic slowing, um, where we see some slowdown in output, industrial production, hiring, um, but not to the degree that would signal a recession. So it's kind of, so either way you look at it, we're going to have slower growth over the coming year. And coming from that really strong growth that we've had over the past year, it's going to feel a little bit like a recession, even if we avoid it, um, just because the economy is slowing pretty sharply. And even if everything goes right that I've talked about previously, that's still going to come with a slower economy there. Um, but that said, um, I think that 
we're on a path currently where we could avoid a full on recession. We could end up in this slower scenario, this blue line here where yes, it's slower than we've been, but it's not going into this level of these previous recessions that you see with the gray lines here. So we're in a bit of a vulnerable state. We're vulnerable to any of the previously mentioned shocks that could go wrong, but along the path that we're on right now, I think we could end in this slow session scenario, this slower economic growth without a recession. Thanks, and that, that's great advice and um, probably a, a great time for us to turn to kind of turn to our panel. We, we really appreciate you setting the stage for us here with the national outlook and, and some of these indicators. It's great information for everybody to have and, and always appreciate hearing from Moody's. No, oh, thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me here today. Turning now to our panel of budget directors, I'm pleased to introduce NASBO leadership. Lauren Larson, NASBO 2022-2023 president from Colorado. Kim Mernix, NASBO 2022-2023 president-elect from Ohio. And Kate Nass, NASBO 2022-2023 past president from Oregon. NASBO is very fortunate to have Lauren, Kim, and Kate leading the association. And I'm particularly grateful to them for making time in their demanding schedules during this hectic time of year to have this conversation with us today. And that's a, a very good place to start our discussion. Um, could you all talk a little bit about where your state is and its budget process, and also following up on Emily's national outlook, what you're seeing in your state's economy? Um, maybe, Lauren, you could kick us off? Sure thing. Thanks for uh, hosting us, at, um, Shelby, and this will be um, great to hear what's going on in other states as well. So from Colorado's perspective, we just submitted a package for the to launch the governor's second terms, Governor Jared Polis with priorities in closing our workforce gap, reducing property taxes, and trying to make some, making some big investments in education, and as well as um, a tax credit package around green climate um, investments. So our economy is, is going very well. We have one of the best labor force particip participation rates in the country. We have climbed back from that really fast from COVID. We also um, have unemployment below the national average, so things are looking really strong. Um, but we're, you know, we're we're nervous about what we're seeing. There is a little bit of uh, softening indicators that we have our eyes on. No, what about in Ohio, Kim? Good afternoon. Um, Governor DeWine delivered his executive budget for the upcoming biennium, which is this first budget of his second term to our General Assembly last Tuesday, January 31st, during his State of the State Address. Um, in Ohio, we budget for two years, and our fiscal year is July 1st through June 30th. So we're in the very initial phases of our legislative process, and I actually testified today in our House Finance Committee. Um, the, our budget, Governor DeWine's budget, is focused on children. It's focused on our educational system. It's focused on higher education, affordability, and it's focused on our workforce and on our economy. Currently, our fiscal position here in Ohio is strong. This budget is structurally balanced, and our our revenues are are running a little a little ahead of projections. So, we're looking forward to the upcoming legislative process. And Kate, how about in Oregon, where you are in a gubernatorial transition? Yeah, I was going to say I'm almost identically in Oregon to Ohio. Um, from a fiscal status, except for we have a new governor. And so we just released uh, Governor Kotek's first budget as um, governor. She, um, that came out um, just last week on Tuesday. Um, so yeah, so um, where we're at is we're, um, we're looking at kind of a fiscal picture where our biennial budget, similar to Ohio, um, our biennial budget is about flat to where we were last or current biennium or this last cycle. And so um, that feels hard when we're dealing with inflation costs and whatnot. So um, it does, um, the revenues being flat kind of and having that significant increase. And I know we'll probably talk a little bit about the increase of federal funding and one-time funding that happened over the current biennium and last biennium, but um, <clears throat> it feels more like a cut. And so we had to kind of make some hard choices and um, we ended up uh, pulling some money out of our 
rainy day fund and end stability fund in the sense that we are not making more investments to those those accounts. We can talk a little bit. They're pretty well funded right now. They're higher than they've ever been. But given kind of the need for some services specifically around houselessness, homelessness, behavioral health access to behavioral health services, and also um, important investments in education, we decided to kind of pull some of that money out knowing that we have a good, strong, stable uh, reserves right now. So that's kind of where we're at and we're looking forward to the session. And I also like Ohio, we're, um, we're not seeing huge slowing, but we also, um, also want to see how the session goes and how we actually balance budget when we're dealing with one-time revenues kind of falling off. Thanks. Given those those Alex, you you touched a little bit on on state revenues. Um, and NASBO collects data on state fiscal collections. And our 2022 fall fiscal survey, which contains information on enacted budgets for fiscal 2023, highlighted the surprisingly strong revenue performance of the past few years. Um, and fiscal 2022 revenue growth was 14 and a half percent and exceeded projections in 49 states. And that followed growth of over 16 percent in fiscal 2021. Um, even adjusted for inflation, the growth in revenues has been has been very strong. We saw that states projected a decline in revenues for fiscal 2023, um, but 33 states have reported in our in the fall survey that they were exceeding those forecasts. Um, what's been your your state's experience with those revenue collections this fiscal year, and and more importantly, what are you seeing as you look into fiscal 2024 and and work through these budgets? Lauren, do you want to want to start with you, Colorado? Sure, the things are looking really strong for the current fiscal year, beating expectations. I think we'll end up with about a 14% surplus uh, from what we're looking now. Um, although we do think that there'll be some shallow slowdown um, later in the calendar year. And Kim, you mentioned that you're running ahead of the forecast this fiscal year. Um, do, you know, do you have an idea of how far ahead and what you might be seeing for fiscal 2024? Yes, um, our revenues are currently running about three and a half percent, three, three and a half, three point eight percent ahead of our updated projections for the fiscal year. So we did do an update to fiscal 23 in July, and we're continuing to update our projections in the budget. So so we did an update in July that we're running ahead of we're, we are um updating now as we're introducing the budget. And our fiscal 24 forecast is conservative given national and global economic uncertainties, but we are projecting moderate revenue growth in fiscal 24. So um, things are strong here in Ohio, but we are being very conservative, very careful as we project the upcoming budget because of all of those uncertainties that we're all seeing. And Kate, do you want to add a little more uh, context and detail about, about where Oregon's seen in its revenue forecast? Yeah, um, for those of you who don't know, I think a lot of everyone, a lot, most people know um, Oregon has a, what's called the kicker. And so when we have an upward adjustment to our forecast, it goes out in the next biennium as a uh, tax credit to our tax um, payers. And so this is really around personal income tax for also those of you who don't know Oregon is um, very reliant on personal income tax. And so um, when we see the in income growth and um, especially of kind of higher wage earners, we we see that uptick in the revenue and our general fund taxes. Um, so our current, we they've released, uh, our economists released a forecast in November. It showed a pretty significant kicker for our taxpayers, which means that we are coming in pretty pretty warm, <laughs> pretty hot from our revenues, and um, which is great. And that does mean that it goes back out to our taxpayers here in the kicker, which will have, which has an impact on the revenues for next biennium, which is kind of one of the reasons why our revenues are pretty flat as we look through um, our budget and we balance to that. So that's part of our overall budget balancing as we, we project out that quicker, we know that's coming and then we um, do our, we set our budget compared to that. So we are for next biennium expecting a little bit of a slow, but not nearly, not necessarily a, a decrease or anything. So we, we, we're we not quite, we're watching it. Kind of like what Lauren said too. There's a few indicators that we're just kind of keeping an eye on. Now, Lauren, do you want to um, add anything about, you know, Colorado has a bit of the same situation where sometimes your your revenues are growing, but you can't necessarily spend them. 
Yeah, that's the 14% surplus I referenced that will go back to our taxpayers as uh, refunds. We had a record uh, rebate to taxpayers this year under a taxpayer bill of rights constitutional provision, and it's looking pretty close to record again for next for this for 2023. Okay, uh, it's it's clear that that all of you are are thinking about a downturn, and that's that's probably the question I get the most is if budget officers are are thinking about recession, and I'm sure that you'd all agree with my my answer is usually that budget officers are always thinking about the next downturn, whenever that might be. And of course, the most visible action that states have taken um, to prepare for that is growing their state rainy day funds. In fiscal 2021, rainy day fund balances grew an incredible 58%, and they continue to grow in fiscal 2022 and are projected to increase again in fiscal 2023. While the levels vary by state, 30 states reported rainy day fund balances representing at least 10% of general fund spending, with 19 states reporting balances exceeding 15% of general fund spending. Uh, another stat I should probably mention is that our state's total balances. NASBO defines total balances as rainy day funds plus a state's general fund ending balance. And these have seen tremendous growth recently as well. Um, they've roughly tripled in size over the past two years. In fiscal 2023, total balances are projected to total just under 25% of general fund spending. And with the stronger than expected revenue growth of the past few years, we've seen states take other steps to increase their fiscal resiliency, um, such as paying off debt, paying cash instead of bonding for capital projects, um, making supplemental payments to pension plans and, and more. So to that end, what are some of the ways that your state has better positioned itself to weather a downturn in the economy? Uh, maybe we could start with Kate this time. Uh, thanks. Um, so I, so our reserves, like basically what Shelby just talked about are pretty, pretty solid. And I think I mentioned earlier that um, because we have our strong reserve balances and we are looking at kind of a, a slowdown in our revenues, especially with the significant kicker going back out to taxpayers, um, we are, we're, we're expecting to not make new deposits into our reserve account. So right now, um, Shelby, I track ours on a biennial basis. So we're at a little over 7% on a biennium, uh, which means we're kind of more in the 14% of an annual budget on our reserves between, we have two, we have a rainy day fund and we have what's called the head stability fund, which basically education stability fund, which basically must go to education. Um, so we are, um, we're feeling pretty good about that. We're watching the economy to see if there's any downturns or any signals of um, something that we need to slow down. But right now, we know that there's some, some services and some work that um, the state needs to provide in order to get people housed and um, access to needed care and services. So uh, that's where we're at. And Lauren, what about Colorado? What are some other resiliency efforts that you've seen? I am so proud of where we're sitting with reserves. When Governor Polis took office, we were at seven and a quarter percent reserves, despite the fact that our last two recessions hit our general fund by 17 percent. Uh, so we are now, I'm proud to say, up at 15, a 15 percent reserve, and with a really strong budget recommendation to hold that, to hold that, and um, the importance of keeping those reserves because of just how quickly what we saw in the in the even brief COVID recession of just how quickly um, a downturn can can hit your general fund and how quickly those reserves can dry up. So really proud of that. The, we also have taken a, um, several actions to prepay future liabilities um, in our general fund and tuck away some money to specifically meet those liabilities that we want to make sure don't um, fall under pressure if should their the revenues tighten. And Kim, anything to add? Yes, well, I am very, very um, proud as well as of where Ohio is. We're very well positioned for any um, possible paths that our economy might take, including a possible um, national downturn. Our budget stabilization fund, our rainy day fund is full. We just transferred more than 700 million into our rainy day fund just um, a few weeks ago. And so now we are at a record balance. And that's a focus for us. Ensuring that we're fiscally balanced is important 
And in addition to that rainy day fund savings account, we've planned in our budget and included a human services reserve fund so that we ensure that we have the resources to pay, to pay for Medicaid as the federal government phases down their enhanced FMAP over the upcoming year. Because we know that enrollment will not return to those 2019 levels as quickly as that extra federal match will phase out. So we're prepared for that by creating a, an extra reserve fund in our budget. So we've been proactive. We also have continued to make very specific investments in our workforce um, to spur ongoing economic growth so that we can prepare Ohio to continue to see success, even in the face of some of the headwinds that we're seeing. And Governor DeWine also worked with our legislative leaders to allocate some of our one-time state cash to cash fund our most recent capital budget, replacing debt um, with cash on hand. And so far, by cash funding our capital program, we have saved taxpayers more than a quarter of a billion dollars in what would have been future interest had we instead issued bonds. So we're we're really excited that we've been able to take some some steps to 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 lock in savings for future years. I'm glad that you brought up um, fiscal balance because another term that we hear a lot these days is fiscal cliff with the the receipt of one-time federal aid and one-time state funds collected from exceeding revenue forecasts. There's there's always that, that worry that states will spend those funds on ongoing programs that can't be sustained once the one-time funds are spent. Um, so I'm curious how your states are approaching the use of one-time funds from federal aid and budget surpluses and, and what steps you're taking to avoid that fiscal cliff when those funds run out. And Kim, since you, since you mentioned it, um, and we'll turn to you first. Sure. Well, in addition to, to using some of our um, cash on hand to fund our capital budget, we I would say Ohio learned the lessons from the Great Recession. And so we have been really careful and we've really purposefully used one-time resources for only one-time investments. But we've tried to focus on investments that will have long-term results. So um, we use one-time federal funding to pay off our unemployment insurance debt from the pandemic so that we that would not be a drag on our businesses and our um, economic recovery and resurgence. We have invested in water and wastewater infrastructure projects in communities all across our state. And we've dedicated more than a half a billion dollars of our federal resources to one-time projects and, and especially one-time projects in our Appalachian communities so we're investing those one-time state dollars to, to really fund our economic infrastructure, things that we can spend money one time on that really will have um, you know, historic and, and, and lasting results. We wanna make sure that we can continue to attract um, big projects like Intel and Honda, some of the things we've announced here in Ohio over the last um, year or so. And we're doing things like creating innovation hubs in our mid-sized cities and communities. That's that's another of the priorities for how we're using one-time dollars in, in the governor's um, biennial budget. Thanks, and uh, Lauren, what, what kind of steps have you taken in Colorado? So similar to Ohio, and it's actually really exciting in the budgeting world to have this focus on one-time investments and what's the ROI of a dollar spent. And one of the really um, oppor exciting opportunities that this infusion of federal stimulus dollars provided was to create this kind of conversation in the fiscal communities with an intention level that it, that it didn't have before. So in Colorado, that resulted in some of the similar investments um, that I um, heard from, from Kim that including paying down the debt in our unemployment insurance trust fund, including big workforce investments. We have um, affordable housing and behavioral health were key areas for transformational change. So I would say overall, we're, we're, we've been very close in trying to manage anything that the federal stimulus money or some of our one-time state dollars we're not expecting to recur, that those went to um, to expenses that, to investments rather than base building expenses. And we have a very um, a, a robust process internally for watching that, watching the roll off, having the timing well planned 
and for doing the important messaging that needs to happen if there is going to be a roll off. Um, and I would say we were successful. We're in partnering with the legislature here about, I would say about, um, there's maybe five to 10% of the um, investments that are in the category of things that we really need to look hard at would do they have ongoing expenses that we think are a priority to keep going? And I, that to me feels like a huge win to be in the five to 10% range when there were, there were billions to spend and billions to invest. And there was a lot of pressure for, for things that would be um, really building up our budget, our base budget in a way that wasn't sustainable. So we are um, have a, a robust internal operation to to make sure we have our eyes on those pieces that do need some ongoing funding and how to plan around that. Um, and uh, overall, some in, some invested dollars that are starting to um, reap rewards in our state. And, and how about in Oregon, Kate? Yeah, um, so in Oregon, so like Colorado, we had both the one-time federal revenues and also kind of general, the state general fund or state revenues that we don't necessarily expect to continue just because of that economic impact of um, the increased federal spending or federal funding in our state. And so um, a lot of what we've done over the last couple of years has been in one time in nature, although it helped boost current programs. So we tried a lot of times not trying to set up whole entirely new programs but kind of boost some of the programs that needed help. I'm thinking like wage increases in order to help with our hospital and our nursing staffing and things like that with some of our uh, Medicaid contracts and long-term care systems that we really did need to kind of keep keep those operating. Um, and then uh, a lot of um, infrastructure that we could do, um, like Kim and both and Lauren mentioned on the water infrastructure, that's a big you know, we want to make sure we're addressing that. And this is a perfect opportunity for us to work um, to look at those projects and be able to fund more of those. Um, the budget that just was released um, last week with Governor Kotak, uh, Governor Kotak's budget, she um, she wanted to continue all those investments. So a lot of times it's kind of hard to get that construction project done and all that stuff. And so we, we definitely kind of just kept those moving. We did not want to pull any of that back and we wanted to keep that um, keep that momentum to make sure that people um, finish those projects and we can reap the benefits of these one-time funding. The other things that um, a lot, even though there was increases in rates or uh, wage increases and things like that, um, they were all one-time in nature. And then it becomes a policy choice of whether or not you roll those back into the next biennium's budget. And so I think Lauren was kind of touching on that a little bit. So while we did do, um, we, we did increase rates and wages um, for hard to like difficult um, workforce uh, areas. And, but they were all, all ones that kind of rolled off. And then now it's a policy choice of if you continue them or maybe do less of an increase going forward. And so that's kind of what's going forward. Um, Governor Kotek's budget continued most as we could. Um, obviously some couldn't be continued, but we're working through those. Picking up on what you said about some some things being a policy choice about about whether to continue and, and also what Lauren said about looking at the ROI of the investments. One of the words that we heard a great deal when Treasury launched the state and local fiscal recovery funds was transformative. And I'm curious if your state's piloting any programs with these funds that that you may continue if they do yield positive results, if you if you see what you um, you know, what you're hoping to see from those. And and Lauren, I know since you since you mentioned the the ROI of some of those dollars, I wondered if you'd like to like to kick us off and start that. I'll highlight tra our transportation investments, which helped us secure the the stimulus funds. Helped us secure a deal in the state that had long been eluded to change the financing mechanism for how we're paying for Colorado's roads and move us into a future uh, transportation state that we hope will be better on our climate. So we are, um, without those dollars, we the deal never would have gotten done. It's, and and now we're just seeing huge rewards. We had a 10 year transportation plan, but it wasn't funded. <laughs> you know, we had a plan for what all we needed to do to support our transportation infrastructure and really very little idea of how we were gonna find the dollars to make it happen. Well, now that is a fully funded 10 year plan and is the seed money that is draw that is drawing down and making us competitive for a lot of 
um, grants through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So a, a, a separate government um, stimulus effort, but the, the two are, it's working in um, complementing each other in a way that's making things possible in Colorado that weren't before. Uh, that's incredible to hear. Kim, are, are you seeing same sorts of things in Ohio? We have been we, we've been really focused on on making sure that our investments with these one time funds are 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 transformative, have long term results, but but don't create new programs. So we focus a lot on infrastructure. And so one example is um, we have used the federal funds to invest in expansions of our facilities for children's behavioral health. So those um, federal funds are also being used for growing our healthcare workforce. We're also allocating more than $150 million toward lead abatement in our communities. So these investments will, will yield positive results for years and really prepare Ohio to be stronger for generations, um, really focusing on what, what can we do to, to improve our infrastructure to improve um, our communities for people. So they're really at the center of everything that Governor DeWine and, and our administration does. And so we've really looked at this as a fantastic opportunity to invest in those things that we may not have had resources to do before and take care of some, some things that will really pay off for, for generations to come. It's exciting to hear those investments that, that will pay off for generations and, and see. I think that that's a, a good use of the word transformative. Um, Kate, how about in, in Oregon? So um, I kind of want to just say ditto to a few of the, not specifics, but a lot of the infrastructure, especially that Kim was talking about and others. Um, so we did a little bit. And the other one that I haven't heard a whole lot here is we did a pretty significant investment on what we're calling Future Ready Oregon, which is really about getting um, workforce trained and ready to um, and work in jobs that are hard to recruit for across the workforce. And so this includes working with our community colleges and our workforce, our local workforce board and community-based organizations on getting um, individuals trained for family wage supporting jobs as opposed to um, and trying to get that education up, up like kind of up uh, to stood up based on what we're hearing from local communities and so there's a pretty significant investment in that um, workforce piece that we the state has not done in the past um, and then uh, it includes like apprenticeship work and whatnot which is not something that we've been able to fund in the past. And we're hoping that that helps with some um, getting families uh, wage, you know, wait, like a wage that actually will support your family um, than where kind of some of the lower income entry level positions are right now. So uh, again, sounds like things that will pay off for, for a long time to come. Um, you know, speaking of, of workforce and a recruitment retention of state workers are a top concern for, for states. How's your state um, meeting that challenge and, and what are the, some of the things that you're doing to try to recruit and retain state workers? And uh, Kim, do you want to turn to you first? Sure. So, you know, we're consistently, constantly looking at our, our data on um, workforce, vacancy rates, turnover rates, and we've used that to really be targeted in our approach and develop specific strategies to address those area um, areas of the of our workforce where the data shows that we ought to be focused. So it's been a challenge for our institutional agencies. So we've employed very specific strategies um, to address recruitment and retention for those categories of state employees where it's most needed. And we have approached it in a way that that is um, targeted, nimble, flexible. So. Um, Trying to to not um, trying to not make uh, permanent long term changes based on what could be a short term situation. So so we've just again been been really focused and targeted, and it's been largely in in our institutions in those direct care um, classifications where we've um, we've employed things like um, recruitment bonuses. We've, we've done some, some addressing um, pay scales in um, our correctional 
um, workforce. So it, it's it's really kind of it's it's varied and but it's really been specific and based on data. Lauren, how's Colorado approaching this, this issue? This, when I was building this year's budget, employee compensation and meeting this workforce crisis was the big rock that went in first <laughs> and other things had to fit around it because I this is really um, an, an issue we can't just leave unaddressed. The so we have a, a pretty large request in front of the General Assembly this year for uh, in, increases for employee wages and very and some even higher um, increases for the twenty four seven facilities that Kim mentioned and state troopers um other sort of on on demand jobs that are having the toughest um, they're having the most turnover and seeing the most competition for. We're also looking at some experimental things in bon in retention, recruitment bonuses, some housing subsidies, and we're um, looking at some of our underutilized state assets, land, underutilized buildings, things that we can build a, a P3 partnership with, public-private partnership to try and um, tr try and take some of these underutilized assets and solve some of our housing problems and other things that are making it really tight to get the workers where we need them in our highest cost areas of the state. Is Oregon facing a recruitment retention issue as well, Kate? Um, we really are in certain, in certain parts of our state workforce. So institutions, our correctional institutions are having a very difficult time. We also have um, a little bit more of a difficult time in certain regions of the state. So the correctional institutions that are on the east or eastern side um, are having a really difficult time with um, keeping up with the, the need for, um, I mean, we're running into it's unfortunate because people who, officers that are working in our correctional institutions, and some of them, they're working for so such long hours that it's just not safe. And so we we really do need to address that. And so um, the way Lauren just said it, I love it that the the rock had to go in first when we just did Governor Kotek's budget. It was it was very much the the similar in our conversations here in Oregon where we needed to we needed to address um, having um, having enough in in a potential for wages and also ours is going to go through the legislative process as well as so we have a pretty significant request there it's probably it is it's not probably it is the highest we've ever asked for from a salary increase for state employees um governor kotek has uh put it forward in two two different kind of pots one for like the normal wage increases that we do all the time the cost of livings and you know the normal components and also another pot that's really specific for um, recruitment and retentions for really like difficult to um, to uh, recruit and retain employees and to make sure that we have uh, almost it's not our peanut butter is not spread too thin kind of thing. So that is um, something that we are looking at right now. We know that our um, workforce that is showing up every day is where it's, it's hard. It's really hard on some of those industries. So Yes, we are, and I, we are hopeful that this uh, comes across and we'll have a better outcomes here in the future. And since since you both kind of mentioned that that was the, the rock that had to go in first, you, you may have already answered this question, but I'm curious what you see as the biggest challenge that's facing states from, from your own experience and from what you're hearing from your peers. And, and also if you have any insight to share on how you're meeting those challenges. And um, Kate, you wanna, you wanna start? Yeah, um, I'm always like, is it me that unmutes first or is it gonna be Lauren or Kim? I'm always wondering. <laughs> so um, we are, uh, workforce is by far one of the things that we're focused on right now. Um, and it's not just the workforce of our state employees, but also the workforces of the um, industries that rely on our rates. So it's our Medicaid providers and whatnot. We wanna make sure that they're covered. Um, so we did talk quite a bit about that. I do wanna also just say, um, and I've been saying this for the last few years, but the budget whiplash, it just feels, it, I still feel like there's, it's less of the whiplash that we were dealing with during the pandemic, but I do feel like hearing, you know, 
we're all expecting some sort of slowdown. How much will it be? How much do we plan for? Are we covered in our reserve funds? All of that kind of stuff. That's that's the other piece that kind of, I would say, just not necessarily keeps me up at night right now, but is definitely something that's up on my mind. So um, I don't want to belabor the uh, workforce thing, but I, the other piece for me is the budget kind of uncertainty. And Lauren, since, since you also had said that with the big rock, um, is, is that the biggest challenge or do you have another one that you think is is out there for states? Oh yeah, and I, I think um, there, there are a lot of challenges with, that we have a lot less control over is that I'm much more worried about that, you know, the economy, what's happening with the national economy, with the world economy is very much uh, on our minds and we're watching, you know, savings. There was a really high buildup in the economy of excess savings and that has started to shrink. Uh, we're seeing um, some increasing in consumer credit lines, especially among um, lower income households. So there's there's some softening there that has us worried. And you know, we certainly have our eye on that. Um, we I also would throw in this mix of big challenges. Uh, it's how we're funding emergency response and natural disasters is is on my mind is uh, the the past few wildfires, floods, and other problems in Colorado, and I know in other states. They've gotten vastly more expensive and how we're planning for that and handling that and making investments in resiliency for our state, for our country is, you know, should be top of mind for all of us. And I know it certainly is in every budget office. Um, and last, I'll, I'll just mention um, inflation and the patterns, you know, with even with some cooling, there's some hot spots that are tough food inflation, shelter inflation, we're really seeing um, housing and rental prices um, very high in Colorado and um, have some um, important policy levers that we're trying to apply to reduce red tape, increase the, the supply of housing in our state and um, you know, hopefully um, tackle that before it gets out of control. Kim, what are you seeing as the biggest challenges? Well, uh, some of the things we've talked about already, but just continuing to navigate the global and national economic uncertainties, being prepared for all possibilities and focusing on what real-time data and indicators we, we can be really focus in on and pay attention to so that we can react quickly. It's really an ongoing challenge and you you just can't take your eye off the ball. Um, some of the things we've talked about already, using one-time funds for one-time investments so that we avoid those um, budget cliffs. That, that's really just a, a critical, critical um, continuous message as, as we're planning the budget, as we are, are navigating all of the um, possible investments we can make, just making sure that we are using those one-time dollars in, in um, ways that, that make sense and that allow us to continue to stay, not just balanced, but really structurally balanced. Um, we're also focusing on government accountability, eliminating duplication and streamlining and strengthening our services for all Ohioans. Again, investing in people and our communities and our economy while we keep our fiscal house in order. And, you know, we're just laser focused on growing and the future for Ohio. Right now, we have more available jobs than we have people to fill them. So, you know, a lot of our budget is focused on the economy and the workforce. But I'll, I'll say if anyone listening is looking for a fabulous new opportunity, we have it for you here in Ohio. That's great. I, um, you know, I, I don't want to, we're, we're running out of time and I, I don't want to end on a challenging note. Um, so, so maybe the few short words, is there an initiative or an idea or an accomplishment that you're the most excited about as we're, as we're kicking off 2023, something, um, so we, we can end on a, on a positive note. Um, Kim, do you want to share, share what you're looking most forward to in the new year? Sure. I'm looking forward to, to, um, talking with everyone about Governor DeWine's budget and, and the piece in that budget that I personally am most excited about is we're creating a $2.5 billion um, economic development fund. It's the All Ohio Future Fund. And again, we're using those one-time resources in ways that we can ensure that Ohio is the place to be for, for generations to come. Kate, what's something that you're excited about for 2023? 
Um, so for me, I think one of the things for me is stepping back from the pandemic, coming back and being able to step back and do that more strategic look as opposed to reacting. I'm really excited to have that um, kind of strategic look. And um, I'm really looking forward to some of the investments and conversations that are happening uh, in Governor Kotak's budget around houselessness, homelessness, the uh, work we're going to do to make sure that we have people housed in a shelter and affordable uh, home to stay in. So. And Lauren, what, what's your exciting things and in, in initiatives this year? I'm really excited about Governor Polis's workforce initiative to close the gap. You know, it hit me like a ton of right over the head when I came across a statistic that even if we doubled the number of high school seniors in Colorado and got them appropriately trained for the, the job openings that are out there now, we, even if we doubled the number of seniors, we wouldn't have enough people to fill the jobs for the openings that we have in Colorado. So this is top of mind for us. It's, a, you know, we need to close the gap. And so there's an exciting initiative around free community college for our top professions that where we have the largest gap. So um, healthcare professions, education, for example, if you wanna be a paraprofessional um, or early childhood educator, we have um, technical education around the construction trades and we're really, and then we have um, some scholarship programs that have not just free tuition and fees, but um, living supports, childcare supports. If you're from, particularly from a, a, a family that hasn't, you know, it's your first in your family to go for higher for higher education. So we're really excited about this package and its ability to make uh, an improvement for Colorado and close our workforce gap. I love that we're ending on this note where, where what you're talking about is how excited you are about your jobs and, and what you're doing and really bringing us back to the fact that, uh, you know, people think about state budgets as just dollars and, you know, revenue and expenditures, but it's really about people and the investments that, that your governors and your offices are able to make to, to make your citizens' lives better. And I think that's really exciting. Um, it's been wonderful to have the opportunity to discuss fiscal conditions and the outlook and all that's going on in your states with you today, and, and also to hear from Emily with Moody's Analytics. NASBO appreciates your leadership, both of our association, but also of your states, and that you would take the time during such an incredibly busy budget season um, for all of you to, to share with all of us today that are here. Um, we also appreciate, of course, the time of everyone who's joined us today. Um, please visit the NASBO website at nasbo.org to stay up to date with fiscal analysis, summaries of governor's budget proposals and state of the state addresses and more information. Thank you to our presenters and thank you to everyone who joined us. Please enjoy the rest of your day.